Newspapers talked about it. People wanted to know. But nobody could penetrate the mystery. What was going on? Strange flying machines were plowing the skies of Italy. It was the 50s. Some people took incredible photos. Others were frightened and shouted, They're here! They're among us! While still others believed the aliens had come to help. But who were they? Where were they from? Above all, what did they want? Many knew, but kept quiet. A mystery that has remained as such for decades. A secret now revealed. Friendship. The incredible story of mass contact between humans and extraterrestrials. Until recently, the phenomenon of contactism, or the deliberate encounter repeated over time between men and evolved extraterrestrial entities, was believed to involve only a few chosen individuals, or contactees. Many of them went down in history. George Adamski, Howard Menger, Eugenio Siragusa, just to name a few. All of them faithfully abided by this cliché. But in 2007, something happened that would change the cards on the table. Stefano Breccia, an engineer from Marche, living in Ambruzzo, published some startling papers that seemed to reveal the story of repeated direct encounters between more than 100 people and extraterrestrial beings living in numerous secret bases on our planet. The main figure of the event told by Breccia is the writer Bruno Samachicha. The case is said to have taken place mainly in and around Pescara. It would all begin in 1956 and would last for many years. The film clips and photographs that have emerged so far are of considerable interest, but even more extraordinary are the testimonies of the individuals involved. Everyone called this story friendship and that is the name that has come down to us today. Thanks to Stefano Breccia's courage, one of the most awe-inspiring sagas in ufology has come to light. It wasn't an easy decision to decide to make it known. It all started from an idea by Bruno Sammaciccia. He'd been thinking about writing down his experiences and then asked me to be the one to do it and so I was at his house for a month to record his stories. Then I put everything together. Besides granting his dear friend's wishes, Breccia had set himself another objective. One reason is to hope that it might work as bait to encourage other people in the group to come forward. Gaspare de Lama and his wife Mirella are among those still alive today who were involved in the friendship events and who accepted Breccia's invitation to come forward. They now live on the shores of Lake Como. Gaspare admired Stefano's courage to expose himself so directly despite being a well-known figure in science and academia. He had no hesitation about exposing himself and I admired him for that. And so coming out and talking about my experience becomes easy for me because it gives me great joy. The joy of being able to tell people something that can help them understand more or make their doubts grow or disappear or strengthen their belief. Gaspare da Lama became a fan of ufology in the late 40s and, together with his wife, sought a path to greater awareness. Even Gaspare's mother took part in the events. Gaspare, Gaspare his mother Zita and I had finally achieved our goal which was to get to know them. We were hoping for an experience with teachers who could help us improve. 
In the friendship story, Samachicha called the beings by the name of W-56. They weren't a single race, but a group of extraterrestrial beings coming from different parts of the universe. Although they looked like humans, there were considerable differences in height, which ranged from one to six meters. The first encounter took place in April 1956. Bruno Samachicha was there, along with his two friends, Giancarlo and Giulio. Bruno said that an old friend had given him this parchment because Bruno collected antiques and while looking at it they noticed it was a map of the castle above Ascoli Piceno at Roccapilla. It seemed to be a kind of treasure map so they decided to go and take a look at the area. They went there more than once without ever finding anything in particular until one night when they came across these people. At a certain point these two came out from a path that runs around the castle, introduced themselves and started to talk. One of them was particularly short, about one meter in height, and the other extremely tall, 2.5 meters, something like that. As for the rest, they looked like normal people. But what happened in that encounter? According to the eyewitnesses, the two aliens spoke perfect Italian. The thing that immediately struck them was the strong sense of love that emanated from these beings. The information they gave to Bruno, Giancarlo and Giulio was awesome, to say the least. They said that Earth had been created for a positive purpose and that man was turning everything into evil. That the morality level of humans was much lower than their own. They explained that this is a very critical moment in human history. Atomic weapons are capable of destroying the planet in a matter of minutes, a tremendous risk that could come to pass because of our low moral sense. Their task was to ensure that the situation didn't get out of hand. They said they weren't here to conquer, as there was nothing to conquer. That everything stemmed from the need for love and respect, and that everything should be done in accordance. They knew Earth's history, philosophies and religions perfectly. They said they'd already been on Earth for many centuries, living at secret bases in various places on the planet. They preferred not to reveal themselves publicly because people weren't ready for the contact. They expected a positive return from their activity. Their goodness and their truth would be stronger than human doubts. When they left, it was almost three in the morning. The extraordinary experience of friendship began at that very moment. The meetings between Bruno, Giancarlo, Giulio and the W-56, also known as The Friends, continued for several months. During frequent long walks on the beach in Pescara, they gave the humans a good deal of other information. Dim Pietro was the name of the captain of the extraterrestrial group operating in Italy. Sergio, Sigis, Itao, Kenio, Sinas, Saju, Meredir, Romulus are some of the names that became common within friendship. They were invented by the humans because the W-56 had a different concept for names. One of the most impressive facts regarded their bases. They said they had a number of them scattered around Italy and the world. Their most important European base was right in Italy. And one of the entrances was in fact at Roccapia. The main one was the enormous base at the depths of the Adriatic, almost in contact with the continental shelf, which roughly ranged from Ortona to Rimini as the expanse of its longitude, and in latitude went from the middle of the Adriatic to the Apennines, with an upper limit of 300 meters so vast that it was affected by normal weather. So at times it also rained inside. Then they had many smaller bases, 
closer to the surface. There was one in Pineto, one in Ascoli, three around Pescara, one near Como, one in the Milan area, and, and so on. Many of them were genuine centers of support. But the aliens also explained how they built their bases. In the stories told by Bruno, Giancarlo and Giulio, you're immediately aware of the huge gap in scientific and technological development between humans and the friends. They weren't built by digging, but through a particular mechanism. They were able to compress material laterally. The soil would thicken into what would later become the walls of the base, and then the outer structure was formed by extremely dense and therefore extremely strong material. The funny thing was that it was very unstable, but it always had to be kept standing. All you had to do was flip a switch and everything returned to the initial state. So, for them to open and close a base was a very commonplace operation. The same system was used to create the entry corridors. Even the bases closer to the surface didn't have stable entrances. When they had to enter, they opened a corridor and then closed it again. Aside from the facts related to friendship, the presence of secret extraterrestrial bases on our planet is a subject that scholars have long been aware of. Just as there have been numerous cases of contact throughout the world, like the one the American policeman named Herbert Schirmer described, which occurred in Ashland, Nebraska, on December the 3rd, 1967. The experience took place in, in the United States to the policeman Schirmer, who had a close encounter of the third kind with UFO entities and was allowed on board one of these UFOs. In the course of this encounter with these beings, they told him several things. He would be told that the pilots of UFOs on Earth have different bases of support and they are both underground and below the seas. In the case of friendship, Bruno Samachiccia was the leader, the main reference point. The story of the W56 had started with him. He knew the most since he'd been in the bases, had met them personally, was telepathic, was the one who held the strings, the one who decided, not that he was, I'm the boss. The word boss isn't nice, but we saw him as number one. The relationship that was established between the W56 and the friendship group was not one way. Very soon, the friends started asking for help. At the most prosaic level, they asked for essentially logistical assistance. Then they requested industrial quantities of fruit. Then they needed metals in industrial quantities as usual, but also strange minerals like strontium and barium nitrate, which were very difficult to find since back then they served no useful purpose at all. Today it has applications in telecameras, circuits like that, but in those days we had absolutely no idea what it might be used for. To unload the cargo from the trucks, including fruit, the W-56 used teleporting. They proved they could teleport anything, even people, without any particular problem. They took the whole load of fruit and teleported it, which means that the operation only lasted a few seconds. Of course, all this meant that no outsider could watch the unloading. This often forced Bruno and Giancarlo to invent excuses so the truck drivers arriving with a load wouldn't become suspicious. They usually explained that a team of professional workers would be coming soon to transfer the goods by other means. So, while Bruno invited the driver to some nearby bar to wait for the phantom workers, Giancarlo stood watch over the truck. 
Obviously, the places where they met were chosen in advance. The unloading operation lasted just a few seconds, so when Bruno and the truck driver came back, it was already over. The truck driver was always impressed by the speed and cleanliness of the work. Buying such large quantities and so many varieties of materials was very expensive. Sometimes it was the friends who paid part of the cost, or all of it, maybe in their usual way. But most of the time it wasn't like that, which created more than a few problems. Essentially, the vast majority of the expenses were paid by Bruno. In other words, he took the trouble of paying, the others took part, if and when they could. Throughout this story, definitely out of the ordinary, it seems even more absurd that despite their astonishing technological capabilities, the W-56 needed help to get food or other materials. Not to mention the money that materialized out of nowhere. Of course, they could get whatever they wanted without the slightest problem. As I said, their technology was advanced. In my opinion, putting on this little show served to keep the sense of cohesion tight. In fact, the friends explained that to be able to operate among us, humans had to express their goodwill in a concrete way too. They said, help us to help you. Lots of people who were part of the friendship story saw W-56 flying saucers. These sightings were almost always by appointment. The W-56 indicated the place, date and time, so the humans were able to get organized with film equipment. Sometimes the photos were also published. The series of a flying saucer over Milan, photographed by Gaspare de Lama, ended up in Dominica del Corriere in the second issue of April 1962. The sighting had taken place at the end of February of the same year. The eyewitnesses were Gaspare de Lama, Bruno Samachiccia and journalist Bruno Gibaudi, at the time author of numerous articles on UFOs and one of the first journalists to seriously address the issue. When we were on my balcony in Piazza Giulio Cesare in Milan, when that saucer was photographed, that's why he later wrote the article in the Domenica del Corriere. Besides Bruno, he was present too. Obviously, only now, after the revelations of Professor Brecher and Gaspare de Lama, can we know what really revolved around that seemingly chance occurrence. But how much weight should we give to these claims? Gaspare still remembers one of the sightings perfectly. It happened in the countryside of Treno near Milan. There are still excellent quality photos and a film clip more deteriorated because of the decades that have passed. The W-56 asked Gaspare himself to choose the place. I went back to Bruno and said, that's the place I chose. And then he told me, go buy some film, put it in the camera. And I said, but no, you put it in. No, no, you have to do everything. I said, okay. I put the film in the camera and filmed for a good two minutes. He wanted me to take the film out of the camera. I put it in my pocket and took it to Ferragna, which was then in Via Matteotti, to have it developed. When I went to get it, I took it home and saw the film clip of this beautiful flying saucer that was going up and down almost to the ground. On top of the saucer, you see a dark area, which the W-56 explained was a particular effect of condensation caused by the energy of the flying saucer.
Some of the photos of the series taken in the Treno countryside were lost, but those that remain would provide evidence of the incredible sighting experienced by Gaspare de Lama and Bruno Samachicha. While returning to Milan, the saucer followed them for a stretch, and Samachicha took one more shot, the last of the 12 exposures on the roll. Bruno took a photo of the same flying saucer, which had apparently reappeared there to follow us or to give us a last farewell. The particular phenomenon of condensation does not appear in this shot. This important series of documents was analyzed to evaluate any possible falsification. Back then, digital technologies didn't exist, so it was very difficult to produce high quality forgeries. I accurately and specifically analyzed the photographic material concerning the friendship case. I didn't find any evidence of forgery, such as a small-scale model suspended by cables, superimposed images processing with 3D graphics. From the images of the analyses that were made, I can confirm that the object was quite large. We're talking roughly four to five meters around. And this also agrees with the testimonies of, of the people I spoke with. And the object is precisely inserted into this context of lights, shadows. Therefore, it is perfectly placed in its environmental context. As part of the friendship case, an enormous amount of photographic material and film clips about flying saucers was produced. Much has been distributed indiscriminately. Much has been lost and even stolen. And much more is still locked in the drawers of other unknown participants who don't want to make themselves known. However, there's enough material available to give us an idea of just how incredible the events would have been. All the material that is known to date is thanks to Gaspare de Lama and Stefano Breccia. In the friendship case, there were literally hundreds of photos, videos, audio recordings, and that's about it since technology ended there at the time. Over time, friendship would involve other people who took part in this incredible experience in various ways. Everybody had the opportunity to see the phenomena and many had the chance to personally meet the W56. The number and kinds of individuals involved in Italy alone would be considerable. I have a file where there are the names of, I think, 120 people who were involved in this story in some way. Those are the people I'm aware of, but who knows how many others there are that I don't know about. The people involved in friendship came from all walks of life. There was a cross-section of normal society. Friendship was also active in other countries, in France, Switzerland, Germany, particularly in Germany, but also in Siberia, in Argentina, and who knows how many other places, in Australia. As we've seen, Teleportation was one of the most impressive technological capabilities the friends had. This system was used to materialize and dematerialize objects of various sorts, and even slips of paper with the written answers to questions asked by those who were present at the meetings. Their technology is infinite. There were so many things I saw. The ones I remember the most were the teleports. Their film reels, or even, sometimes, written notes or film clips of flying saucers that we would then watch just came from above. They materialized in mid-air in the room. Sometimes they came from the floor and tapped me under the chair. Sometimes I saw them materialize in the air. Along with teleportation, some of the most frequent phenomena were communications between the friends and the humans through normal radios. This was also done their way. 
Their technology was virtually indistinguishable from magic. For example, if I took two identical radios tuned into the same frequency and put them side by side awaiting their message, their message could be heard on one radio while the other radio continued its normal broadcast as if nothing was happening. So there was obviously insane amounts of energy involved and directivity just as crazy. So I bought myself one of those transistor radios. Bruno told me to put it there on the cabinet. In five minutes, they'll prepare it for you. In fact, after five minutes, there was a big crack. A sort of greenish flame came out, and Bruno said, There, now it's ready. And they immediately greeted me through the radio. CG, and I could also change the frequencies. The broadcast continued. Some of these communications were also recorded with the reel-to-reel -reel devices existing then. Gaspare still owns some of the tapes. For the first time after so many years, the voice of the W56 is made public. Cari amici, cari figlioli, siate certi di noi poiché nessuno tra noi vacillerà. Voi siate uniti, uniti, uniti e sopportate le vostre debolezze reciproche, lottando e migliorando come uomini e come nostri cari amici. Il nostro mondo per voi cari non è facile a capirsi. Questo è naturale, ma con l'affetto e la fiducia potrete ugualmente stare vicino ai nostri cuori aperti a voi e comprenderci di più. Un abbraccio fatto di caldo affetto e di pura amicizia dal vostro Radios weren't the only communication tools used. Sometimes the friends would also insert themselves into normal television programs. I remember once there was a film. And it was interrupted and their saucers were seen flying. While in the background their voices may be only greeting us that time. A fourth witness of the extraordinary events of friendship who accepted Breccia's invitation to speak is the professor of design, Paolo Di Girolamo. His experience was very brief. He met the friendship group only a couple of times. Always a ufology enthusiast, Di Girolamo knew Consul Alberto Perigo and journalist Bruno Gibaldi personally. And it was precisely the latter to put him in touch with Bruno Samachiccia in Pescara. Paolo had with him a letter he'd written for the W56. And he welcomed me into a kind of living room, so to speak. I enter, I lay this letter on the console and I sit down on the sofa. At one point, Bruno Samachiccia says, we should be getting some news, let's see. He takes this radio and turns it on. The radio was playing music and then we hear a piercing whistle. Really a very loud hissing sound. I hear Sigir here. Hello, Paolo. Be honest with us all. Be honest with us all. Be honest with us all. Three times. Then another voice says, let's get the goods. Now, the goods, in my opinion, had to be a big parcel Samachicha had taken, all lined in black and placed on top of the television set. A very loud crackle, a real blinding purple flash, just like that, and then there was nothing. After this event, which leaves Paolo speechless, the group goes out into the street. 
and when they come back inside, Paolo realizes that his letter, which he'd left on the table, was gone. For a moment, they talk about who might have taken it, but nobody understands. Samachicha's wife also denies touching it. At that point, Bruno urges everyone to go out into the street again. There wasn't a soul in sight at all, around midnight or something like that. At a certain point, I feel, something falls on my head, a little piece of paper all folded up. It was a scorched envelope, open, and it was the letter I'd left on the console. To make the phenomena possible, or to amplify them, including telepathy, which they made wide use of, the W56 used devices that were called nuclei. They could be placed in objects, in rooms, or even in the bodies of living creatures, including people. These nuclei were, for them, a These nuclei were a necessary thing for them. Like if I want to receive a phone call from you, I need to have a phone at my house. Bruno had a German shepherd named Dick. The friends told Bruno that the dog would play an important role in the contacts and in certain operations that called for the help of the humans. He would become a sort of amplifying antenna. So they asked Samachicha to bring the dog to the seaside. And at their command, which came by telepathy, Dick was made to go into the water. At that point, the friends would treat the dog, placing nuclei under his paws. In fact, Dick was almost always with Bruno. In one of the film clips that have come to light, we see him looking out of the window while Bruno is filming a UFO circling over the palazzos of Milan, where Bruno lived for a while. It isn't the only ufological document made in Milan. One of the more controversial pieces of information that the W56 gave to their human friends concerned a conflict with an artificial race called Wiros, but which Samachicha renamed with the term CTR, which was the contraction of the word contraries. One of the strange things about the friendship stories is the existence of enemies, the famous contraries, the CTR. While the W56 were ethical, these others were materialistic, virtually the opposite of the W56 in every way. They didn't speak of war, but of conflict, and said one reason they were here was to keep the CTR in check. The friends called them science worshippers, saying the CTR were creatures without scruples. And their greatest fear was that we humans were following the same path the CTR had already covered. For the W56, the feelings of friendship, affection, love and harmony that they were creating between themselves and the human group, just as it is among human beings, were not just defining the quality of relationships. For them, cohesion, friendship, loyalty and things like that are not abstract concepts, but rather a living entity that they call Ureda. This living entity is fostered precisely by the sense of loyalty and was contrasted by an alter ego that was called Reda, which was essentially the opposite. And for them, this energy served as a sort of fuel, let's say, a driving force for some of their means of defense, or anyway, for their tools. The defense instruments Gaspare talks about, the friends explained, were also important for the conflict they had with the CTR. They explained that friendship, which Ureda originated from, was so important that if the group hadn't kept the harmony high, or if the group was even dismembered, they themselves would have fallen victims of the CTR. 
who might well have destroyed their bases. But this wasn't the only reason to be friends. The W-56 said that love, in its most unselfish sense, as well as ethics, respect, and altruism, should guide every thought and every action. They said these values were essential to ensure a safe and healthy evolutionary progress. A lesson that humanity had to put into practice if it wanted to avoid the risk of terrible self-destruction. The mere thought of doing harm was inconceivable to the W-56, and the sense of ethics, morality, pervaded their every action, their every gesture, their every thought. Even their technology, their machines, were consciously impregnated with it. A concept that for us is unimaginable. They said they were incapable of causing harm to anyone. They said that even their very devices would refuse to harm anyone. Ethics permeated everything about them, to the point that they would refuse. Indeed, they said that if they weren't able to avoid harming someone, then in that case they would self-destruct. It wasn't by chance that the journalist Bruno Ghibaldi was with De Lama and Samachicha during the sighting published by Dominica del Corriere. Ghibaldi was extremely involved in friendship and experienced everything there was to be tried, including the personal encounters with the W-56. Stefano Breccia also knew him. He remembers very well how he joined the group. At the time, Ghibaldi had a program on television about making model aircraft. Giancarlo had seen it by chance, and he liked this person. He asked for Bruno's permission, and Bruno agreed. As a result, Ghibaldi was brought to Milan to meet Bruno, and starting from then, also became a part of the circle. The presence of the journalist was important because he could indirectly publicize a lot of the information that was given by the friends. He was a journalist who could help the case by writing about it, while we didn't have any connections like this. He had acquaintances in the field of journalism and television that we didn't have. The pictures that Ghibaldi took of a UFO over Monte Mario in Rome attracted the attention of Cesare Zavattini. The famous filmmaker interviewed him and put the piece in a documentary film entitled The Mysteries of Rome. The words of Ghibaldi emphasized what the W-56 had said was one of their main tasks on our planet. The control of the nuclear armaments belonging to the superpowers in the fear that man might make the terrible choice of using them, unleashing a total war. In fact, this is one of the key themes of the entire story of worldwide contactism. Adamski, Siragusa, Menja and many other contactees received the same kind of message from extraterrestrials. And the W-56 actually intervened with their UFOs and their technology, but with previously trained terrestrial operators to stop a situation that seemed it might lead to something irreparable. The incident occurred in 1967. So an operation managed by human beings was launched, which was designed to disable all nuclear warheads in the Soviet Union and in the United States in the face of a situation that seemed risky, that might degenerate from one minute to the next. There are books written by officers of the U.S. Air Force, by now retired, which tell the story of how their battery of Minuteman missiles had been rendered inactive by flying saucers revolved in the area. One of the books referred to by engineer Breccia was written by Robert Salas and James Klotz. It contains military documents obtained through the law on the Freedom of Information, the so-called Freedom of Information Act. But there are other clues about the interest these beings had in nuclear weapons. The atomic tests have always been filmed and photographed with special equipment, with technologies that can capture the very first moments of the thermonuclear explosion. In these pictures, we see the explosion in the first few microseconds, when the terrible mushroom cloud hasn't yet formed. 
In the third snapshot, we note the presence of an Adamskian flying saucer a few meters from the explosion. If authentic, this photo would give us an idea of the incredible technological capabilities of these creatures. Another extremely important person in the history of Italian ufology was Consul Alberto Parago, who wrote as many as four books between the 60s and 70s analyzing the world scene and pointing out policy choices made by governments that would have been affected by the overt or covert activities of this sort of alien aviation. Many exceptionally clear photos of UFOs appeared in these volumes. Some of them were even identified as being the inside of a cockpit of a flying saucer. Perigo cited the dates and locations of the sightings, but never mentioned the name of the authors of the photos. The places were almost always the classic zones where the W56 and the Friendship Group were active. Milan, Pescara, Francavilla, Montesilvano. And in fact, the photos were made precisely by the people who were part of Friendship. But we've only learned this today. For Gaspare da Lama, Alberto Perigo was of paramount importance. Perigo introduced him to the comprehension of the profound implications of the UFO phenomenon and contactism at a time when it was extremely difficult to find material about these issues in Italian. And then he told me how things were according to him. Naturally, I reeled a bit of the chair because I didn't expect it. He really knew. I mean, he'd understood a lot. He'd understood. A man of great valor, an idealist, a pure man. He, too, was amazing, very cultured. Perigo also announced to Gaspari that he intended to publish a book where he would reveal everything he knew about the presence in our midst of beings from other worlds, a proposal that never materialized, however. Among the correspondence that Gaspare has kept are letters written by Consul Perigo himself. In one of these, among other things, he talks about his intention to publish the book, I'll Tell All. Other statements made in this excerpt of the letter are also very interesting. Dear, I imagine you've guessed my bitter experience of recent years. For the revelation of the new reality, I'd bet on two men who have disappeared from the scene, John 23 and Kennedy. As is well known, Kennedy died five days before my report went into circulation. As you've seen, everyone keeps quiet or pretends not to know. In 1965, I hope to publish, I'll tell all, but I believe I've already said a good deal. I'm sending you with best wishes, the most affectionate remembrance, Alberto Perigo. But the alleged tasks of these creatures would have been others as well. Another purpose of the presence of the W56 was to help our evolutionary process, to push us to a higher level of understanding. That's why they had been on our planet for a very long time and even shared with us some of our suffering in the matter. They also revealed that their real name was Acri. Stefano Breccia has done research on this name, discovering some very interesting aspects. The word Acri is a plural noun in Sanskrit that means the sages. At that point, I tried to see it in Egyptian, and I discovered that there are two very similar words. The first term, Akriyu, is the name of these divinities, which usually means the wise people. Then it occurred to me to inquire into other languages. I discovered that in classical Greek, Akri means Akeo, or people in high places. In classical Arabic, Akri means group of friends, or something like that. As a proper noun, the word is fairly common, fairly widespread. But this wouldn't be the only trace. Years ago, Count Richard Chamfrey gave the Italian contactee Eugenio Seragusa a strange handwritten letter from Voltaire. It was addressed to the legendary Count of Saint-Germain. The text contains enlightening phrases that would fit perfectly into the context of an alleged alien presence in human history. 
6th of June, 1761. I am answering your letter of April, Lord, in which the appalling revelations make the old man that I have become the confidant to your most terrible secrets, the day of his death. Thank you, Germain. Your long road through time will be illuminated by my friendship for you. Even at the time of your revelations about the middle of the 20th century. Because of time, the talking pictures will not be able to be stored in memory. May your wonderful flying machines bring you back to me. Farewell, my friend. Voltaire, Gentleman of the King. What were the talking pictures that Voltaire refers to? And your wonderful flying machines. What had Voltaire seen? Who was the legendary Count of Saint-Germain really? The epilogue of friendship arrived at the end of the 70s because, unfortunately, the people who revolved around Samachicha failed to deliver on the expectations of the cosmic friends. The group gradually and irreversibly fell apart. The Ureda disappeared and the fears of the W56 seemed to come true. This dramatic moment coincided with the phenomena of the Adriatic, the great wave of sightings that occurred between October 78 and January 79. Officially, the story ended when the CTR managed to get the better. The story is quite difficult to believe from many perspectives. According to me, the adventure of 78 was the surprise ending. I mean, these people were probably fed up with Samachitya and company and decided to bow out in a spectacular way. In my opinion, it continued to go on and I have good evidence of this fact in Italy as well as abroad. Even if the entire story of friendship seems like an incredible science fiction tale rather than an incident that really happened, despite the great controversy about its authenticity, given what has emerged so far, it's difficult to maintain that it had all been an invention. Believe it, don't believe it. In, in any case, we can't help but take into consideration the testimonies of the protagonists and the material that refers to these testimonies. According to eyewitnesses, the sightings, the teleporting and all the other impressive phenomena that appeared were not, however, the real reason these beings were on Earth. The friends defined themselves as the precursors of the spirit world. In the end, the real essence, the soul of this relationship, which unfortunately ended up badly because of human shortcomings, is the immense example of love, dedication and respect that they impressed in the heart of the eyewitnesses still living. The most valuable teachings that I received from among them is this momentum they gave us and this endeavor, perhaps gone amiss, that they've made to love each other truly, to be close-knit and to be united. They enriched me. They put me into contact with an almost impossible world full of love. It was also an exciting experience. Very exciting and magnificent. The feeling that the W56 transmitted was one of great friendship and love. There would be much more to say about friendship. Before leaving, the friends promised to come back and created a bond with the few remaining humans with an oath of mutual fidelity. Even today, these people believe that there are indeed special friends that could help us or who, in all probability, have never stopped doing so.
Newspapers talked about it. People wanted to know. But nobody could penetrate the mystery. What was going on? Strange flying machines were plowing the skies of Italy. It was the 50s. Some people took incredible photos. Others were frightened and shouted, They're here! They're among us! While still others believed the aliens had come to help. But who were they? Where were they from? Above all, what did they want? Many knew, but kept quiet. A mystery that has remained as such for decades. A secret now revealed. Friendship. The incredible story of mass contact between humans and extraterrestrials. Until recently, the phenomenon of contactism, or the deliberate encounter repeated over time between men and evolved extraterrestrial entities, was believed to involve only a few chosen individuals or contactees. Many of them went down in history. George Adamski, Howard Menger, Eugenio Siragusa, just to name a few. All of them faithfully abided by this cliché. But in 2007, something happened that would change the cards on the table. Stefano Breccia, an engineer from Marche, living in Abruzzo, published some startling papers that seemed to reveal the story of repeated direct encounters between more than 100 people and extraterrestrial beings living in numerous secret bases on our planet. The main figure of the event told by Breccia is the writer Bruno Samachicha. The case is said to have taken place mainly in and around Pescara. It would all begin in 1956 and would last for many years. The film clips and photographs that have emerged so far are of considerable interest, but even more extraordinary are the testimonies of the individuals involved. Everyone called this story friendship and that is the name that has come down to us today. Thanks to Stefano Breccia's courage, one of the most awe-inspiring sagas in ufology has come to light. It wasn't an easy decision to decide to make it known. It all started from an idea by Bruno Sammaciccia. He'd been thinking about writing down his experiences and then asked me to be the one to do it and so I was at his house for a month to record his stories. Then I put everything together. Besides granting his dear friend's wishes, Breccia had set himself another objective. One reason is to hope that it might work as bait to encourage other people in the group to come forward. Gaspare de Lama and his wife Mirella are among those still alive today who were involved in the friendship events and who accepted Breccia's invitation to come forward. They now live on the shores of Lake Como. Gaspare admired Stefano's courage to expose himself so directly despite being a well-known figure in science and academia. He had no hesitation about exposing himself and I admired him for that. And so coming out and talking about my experience becomes easy for me because it gives me great joy. The joy of being able to tell people something that can help them understand more or make their doubts grow or disappear or strengthen their belief. Gaspare da Lama became a fan of ufology in the late 40s and, together with his wife, sought a path to greater awareness. Even Gaspare's mother took part in the events. Gaspare, Gaspare his mother Zita and I had finally achieved our goal, which was to get to know them. We were hoping for an experience with teachers who could help us improve. 
In the friendship story, Samachicha called the beings by the name of W-56. They weren't a single race, but a group of extraterrestrial beings coming from different parts of the universe. Although they looked like humans, there were considerable differences in height, which ranged from one to six meters. The first encounter took place in April 1956. Bruno Samachicha was there, along with his two friends, Giancarlo and Giulio. Bruno said that an old friend had given him this parchment because Bruno collected antiques and while looking at it they noticed it was a map of the castle above Ascoli Piceno at Roccapilla. It seemed to be a kind of treasure map so they decided to go and take a look at the area. They went there more than once without ever finding anything in particular until one night when they came across these people. At a certain point these two came out from a path that runs around the castle, introduced themselves and started to talk. One of them was particularly short, about one meter in height, and the other extremely tall, 2.5 meters, something like that. As for the rest, they looked like normal people. But what happened in that encounter? According to the eyewitnesses, the two aliens spoke perfect Italian. The thing that immediately struck them was the strong sense of love that emanated from these beings. The information they gave to Bruno, Giancarlo and Giulio was awesome, to say the least. They said that Earth had been created for a positive purpose and that man was turning everything into evil. That the morality level of humans was much lower than their own. They explained that this is a very critical moment in human history. Atomic weapons are capable of destroying the planet in a matter of minutes, a tremendous risk that could come to pass because of our low moral sense. Their task was to ensure that the situation didn't get out of hand. They said they weren't here to conquer, as there was nothing to conquer. That everything stemmed from the need for love and respect, and that everything should be done in accordance. They knew Earth's history, philosophies and religions perfectly. They said they'd already been on Earth for many centuries, living at secret bases in various places on the planet. They preferred not to reveal themselves publicly because people weren't ready for the contact. They expected a positive return from their activity. Their goodness and their truth would be stronger than human doubts. When they left, it was almost three in the morning. The extraordinary experience of friendship began at that very moment. The meetings between Bruno, Giancarlo, Giulio and the W-56, also known as The Friends, continued for several months. During frequent long walks on the beach in Pescara, they gave the humans a good deal of other information. Di Pietro was the name of the captain of the extraterrestrial group operating in Italy. Siegir, Sigis, Itao, Kenio, Sinas, Saju, Meredia, Romulus are some of the names that became common within friendship. They were invented by the humans because the W-56 had a different concept for names. One of the most impressive facts regarded their bases. They said they had a number of them scattered around Italy and the world. Their most important European base was right in Italy and one of the entrances was in fact at Roccopia. The main one was the enormous base at the depths of the Adriatic, almost in contact with the continental shelf, which roughly ranged from Ortona to Rimini as the expanse of its longitude, and in latitude went from the middle of the Adriatic to the Apennines, with an upper limit of 300 meters so vast that it was affected by normal weather, so at times it also rained inside. Then they had many smaller bases, 
closer to the surface. There was one in Pineto, one in Ascoli, three around Pescara, one near Como, one in the Milan area, and, and so on. Many of them were genuine centers of support. But the aliens also explained how they built their bases. In the stories told by Bruno, Giancarlo and Giulio, you're immediately aware of the huge gap in scientific and technological development between humans and the friends. They weren't built by digging, but through a particular mechanism. They were able to compress material laterally. The soil would thicken into what would later become the walls of the base, and then the outer structure was formed by extremely